Hey guys, and welcome back to Blackthorn Prods. What if I told you that you can have a very solid foundation in C Sharp programming by only mastering nine lines of code? That's right, guys. In this video, I'll share with you the nine lines of code that we use over and over again in our projects that will give you the power to make some amazing games. So programming seems like a very daunting skill to learn, and I can clearly understand why. I mean, when you see videos with all these crazy lines of code, it can scare almost anyone away. So the other day, I was contemplating on the best way that I can teach people how to get started with coding in C Sharp. So I opened some scripts on our latest game, Oloboro, and I quickly came to realize that there was these nine lines of code that made up a huge part of all the game's scripts. But first, this video is sponsored by Xsola. It's an awesome, intuitive, code-free tool that can help you craft the right website for your game. You can design anything you need from a simple landing page to a complex community hub. You can start with a dev-friendly template from their catalog and customize to match your creation or build entirely from scratch. In short, it's your game's home on the web a great presentation tool, and a store where players can buy your work. Check out the link in the description where you can register a publisher account and start using the site builder. So line number one that we use all the time are of course variables. These guys are everywhere and you'll often see them at the top of every script. Variables are basically like boxes that contain data. They store some kind of value inside of them. Variables are incredibly useful to be able to easily tweak the properties of one of your objects. So for example, I might have a fireball projectile, which can have different variables that I can modify, such as the speed of the projectile, the damage it gives, the particles that it will spawn on impact, and so on. So the way you create a variable in C Sharp is very simple. First of all, you need to specify if your variable should be public or private. A private variable is only accessible from within the script that you make it from, whereas a public variable is accessible from any script. Public variables also appear inside of the Unity Inspector, which makes it that much easier to tweak the values. Once you've specified the protection type of your variable, you then need to tell what kind of variable you're making. So there are string variables, which is just text. Then we have got int variables, which is short for integer, so basically whole numbers. Next we've got float variables, which are decimal numbers. And then finally we've got bool variables, which contain either the keyword true or false. So those are the four basic types, but of course there are also all the component types. So for those who didn't know, objects in Unity are composed of different components or features. And we can store those components in variables also. So we can make a transform variable or a rigid body variable and so on. And the last step that you need to do in order to create a variable is to name it. The naming is completely up to you. Of course, you can then optionally assign a value to your variable and then end the line with a semicolon. Okay, so in this example, I've got this little player character who has a player control script that just lets him move around in the scene. At the moment, his speed is set to a hard-coded value, so I can go ahead and create a public float variable called speed. Public, since we want it to appear inside of the inspector. A float because we want to have a nice amount of precision on the value of the speed, in case we need to use a decimal number. And then I just went ahead and called it speed. I've decided not to assign a value to it in the script, since we will be doing that from within the inspector. Hence why we made it public. Now that we have created that variable, I can now replace the hard-coded number with that variable. Alright, so now, thanks to our variable, we can fine-tune the speed of our character directly from within the inspector. Line number two that we use over and over is get components. So remember I told you that objects in Unity are made up of components. Well, sometimes we need to retrieve a certain component on an object to then modify it within our scripts. So in this example, I've got this little character in my scene, who just has three components, the default and obligatory transform component that lets us modify the position, rotation, and skill of our objects, the sprite render component that is in charge of rendering the graphics of our character, and finally, a completely empty c -sharp script that I created called change color. So that's exactly what I'm going to do, 
I want this script to change the color of my object from its default green color to blue, for example. So in the script, I will first of all create a private sprite renderer variable called renderer. So we are making a variable with the same type that has this component right here. But we now need to assign it a value, and that's where our get component line of code comes into play. Inside of the start function, I will set my renderer variable to be equal to get components, then inside of these brackets, we need to specify what component do we want. So sprite renderer, then finish with a pair of parentheses and a semicolon. So with this line, we are simply storing inside of our renderer variable, the sprite renderer component that is attached to our character. And now we can modify to our liking that component. So in this scenario, I will say renderer.color and set it equal to color.blue. So now when I press play, you'll see that our green character turns blue. Note that this get component line only allows us to retrieve a component on the same object that your script is attached to. Okay, line number three is instantiate. This super useful line lets us spawn game objects from within our script. The syntax is very simple. We just need to type instantiate and then we need to give it three different parameters inside of the parentheses. The first one is the game object that we want to spawn. The second is the position at which we want to spawn it at. And the third is the rotation that we want to give it. Of course, end the line with a semicolon. Okay, so in this little example, I've got a completely empty scene, except for this empty game object that just has a script attached to it called instantiate example. In this script, we will first start off by creating a public variable of type game object called character to spawn. Like that, we can now drag and drop our character prefab inside of that variable slot so that Unity knows what we want to spawn. With that done, we can now use our instantiate line and pass in our character to spawn variable for the object to spawn. That way, our script will spawn whatever game object that we dragged and dropped inside of our variable slots. Next, for the position at which we want to spawn him at, we will type vector3.0, which will just instantiate him in the middle of our screen. And finally, for the rotation, I'll say quaternion.identity, which means no rotation. All right, with that done, you'll see that when I press play, our character gets spawned in the scene. This line is used so often. I mean, whenever a game spawns in bullets, particle effects, waves of enemies, and so on, you can be pretty sure that this line of code is behind it all. Okay, passing on to line 4, which is the opposite of instantiate, and that's of course, destroy. So the syntax for this line is also very straightforward. You just need to type destroy and then inside of the parentheses specify what game objects you wish to destroy. You can optionally assign a second parameter to this line of code which would be a float that dictates after how long would you like to destroy the objects. Of course, end the line with a semicolon. Okay, so in this example, we've got in our scene this character and their job is to destroy it. We've also got a destroy example script attached to the character. So let's start off by creating a public float variable called lifetime. Then inside of the start function, we'll use our destroy line of codes. As I mentioned, we now need to specify what game object do we wish to destroy. In our case, it's this object, the one that has this script attached to it. So we can just type game object. Then for the second parameter, we'll pass in our lifetime variable. This way, our object will get destroyed after our lifetime has passed. So in Unity, I'll set my lifetime variable to 2.5. And indeed, once 2.5 seconds have passed, you will see that our character gets destroyed. So instantiate and destroy are really like the bread and butter of game programming. I mean, think of any game and you'll quickly realize that there are always new things getting spawned on the screen and other stuff that goes away. Next off, we've got piece of code number five, which are loops. In this video, we'll just go over the most common for loop, but there are also other types of loops that exist. So a loop is basically a way of repeating a certain piece of code. The syntax is the following. First, we start with the keyword for. Then we put a pair of parentheses. Inside of those parentheses, we start off by creating an integer variable, which is often called i by convention, which stands for iteration. 
then we just assign it the value zero. You could of course set this variable to whatever you want, but I'm just showing you what is most common. Then just finish this section with a semicolon. This is the initializer. Next, we've got the condition. So this could be something like i smaller than three and then end it with a semicolon. So basically the loop will continue to run as long as this condition is true. So as long as i is smaller than three. And finally, the third part is what happens to the variable i each time the loop runs. So this could be something like i++, which just means add one to i each time we go through the loop. Okay, so to recap, we first of all initialize an integer variable and set it equal to some value. Then we state a condition and the loop will continue to run as long as that condition is true. And finally, we need to say what happens to the variable i each time we go through the loop. So here we often increase by one the variable i. So pause the video now and try to think about how many times this loop will run. And the answer is three times. So at the start, i is equal to zero. We are then checking if i is less than three. So of course, zero is less than three. And so we will run whatever code is inside the loop. And then we'll add one to i. So now i is equal to one. We're then repeating this process. So is i still less than three? Yes, and so we run the loop again. Now i is equal to two, which is still less than three, and so we run it again. And now we come to the end. Since we add one again to our variable i, which is now equal to three. And since three is not less than three, well then the loop stops running. Okay, so in this little example, I've got an empty scene with just this one game object who has a script attached to it called loops example. So I would like to spawn in using a loop, a bunch of trees. I'll start off by creating a public integer variable called number of trees to spawn. So if we set this variable to 10, then we'll want to spawn 10 trees. If it's set to 30, then we'll want to spawn in 30 trees. Let's then also create a public game object variable called object to spawn that, you guessed it, will store our tree prefab. So inside of the start function, we need to create our loop. If you have already forgotten the syntax to do so, that's not a problem. If you just type the keyword for and then press tab twice, it will also complete it for you. We will have our variable i start at zero, and then we will continue to run this loop as long as i is less than our number of trees to spawn variable. And then each time we go through the loop, we will increment our variable i by one. Now inside the loop, we will use our most used line of code number three, which is of course instantiate to actually spawn in a tree. So don't pay too much attention to this line of code here, but we're basically calculating a random position so that trees spawn a little bit randomly across our game worlds. So each time we go through the loop, we'll instantiate whatever game object we drag and dropped inside of our object to spawn variable. He'll get spawned at our random position variable that we just calculated here and with no rotation, so quaternion.identity. So now if you press play, you'll see that all our little cute trees are getting spawned across our game thanks to our loop. Let's now move on with piece of code number six, which are if else blocks. This is a huge one. These guys let us code decision inside of our game, which means that with one C sharp script, there can be different outcomes. Let me give you a few examples of scenarios where you might need to use conditionals. Let's say that you want to open a secret door if the player finds a special key. Or let's say you want to play an epic music when the boss is almost dead. Well, these would be perfect examples where you will need to use an if else statement. So this is the syntax. You type the keyword if, and then inside of the parentheses, you put a condition. And then in between curly brackets, you put all the code that you want to run if that condition is true. If the condition isn't true, nothing will happen. Optionally, you can add a nail statement right after your if statements. All the code in between these curly brackets will run if the condition isn't true. All right, so in this small example, I want to have a bool variable. So a variable that contains either true or false called something like is girl. If that variable is true, then I want to spawn in a female character. And if it's false, then I want to spawn in a male character. So in my scene, I've just got a game object with an empty C-sharp script attached to it called male or female. 
Now inside this script, I'll make two public game object variables. One that will store our female character, and the other that will store our male character. Let's also go ahead and create a public bool variable called isFemale. I'll check if my isFemale variable is equal to true. Note that to compare if two values are the same in c -sharp, we use the double equal sign. If that's the case, then I'll go ahead and instantiate the female character in the middle of my scene and with no rotation. Else, so if isFemale is false, then we'll go ahead and spawn in the male character instead. Okay, so back in Unity, I'll drag and drop my female character into the female slot and the male character into the male slot. And let's start off by setting is female to true. And yes, right enough, the female character is getting spawned and not the male. But if we now set is female to false, you'll see that the opposite happens. Let's now tackle line number seven, which is input.getAccessRaw. So games are an interactive piece of art. And so at some point in time, you'll need to manage some kind of input from the player. In this video, we'll focus on keyboard inputs, but there is, of course, mouse input, controller input, and so on. So input.getAccessRaw horizontal will basically return 1 if you're pressing down on the right arrow key, negative 1 if you're pressing on the left arrow key, and 0 if you aren't pressing any. Likewise, input.getAccessRaw vertical will return 1 if you're hitting the up arrow key, negative 1 if you're pressing down on the bottom arrow key, and 0 if you aren't pressing any. These two lines are used very often when creating player movements. So I've opened back up my very first example scene that was for variables, which is just this little character that can move around the scene thanks to his player control script that we made. And now if I open that script, you'll see that the two lines that we just talked about are indeed in this player controller. So let me quickly go over it. So inside of the update function, we're creating a vector3 variable called player inputs. For those who don't know, a vector3 is just a variable that contains three different values, an x value, a y value, and a z value. We're then setting the x value to our input.getAccessRaw horizontal, our y value to input.getAccessRaw vertical, and our z value to zero since this is in a 2D space. So if we aren't pressing any button, this variable will be equal to 0, 0, 0. If we're pressing on the up and right arrow keys, the variable will be equal to 1, 1, 0. If we're only pressing the bottom arrow key, it will be equal to 0, negative 1, 0, and so on. I think you get a grasp of it. Then we're just setting our character's transform position to be equal to its current position, plus our move input vector3 that has been normalized, which just means that it ensures that your character doesn't move faster when going diagonally, as opposed to going in one single direction. We're then multiplying our player input variable with our speed variable, so we can tweak how fast he can move. And finally, we need to multiply also with time.delta time to make the game frame rate independent. This just means that the player character will run as fast on an old laggy computer or in a new fast PC. So as you can see, this line is vital to be able to retrieve player inputs and to then be able to move his character in the direction that he wants. You're also able to get a little deep dive into how to make a very simple player control script. Moving on with line number eight, which is vector2.move towards. We use this line a ton. It's the Blackthorn Prod speciality. This line does exactly what it says. It moves an object from a point A to a point B with a certain speed. So you can basically just set the transform.position of the object you want to move to vector2.move towards. This line takes three different arguments. The first one is the starting position, so that's most of the time just the current position of your object, so transform.position. The second argument is the position you would like to move towards, so the target position. And finally, the last argument is the speed at which you would like to go from the starting position to the target position. Alright, so let's open back up our example scene with the character that can move around. 
We've went ahead and added an evil enemy that has an empty c -sharp script called Chase. So that's exactly what we want him to do. We want him to follow the player around. So in the script, I'll start off by creating a public game object variable called targets. This variable will of course store our player character since he is the enemy's target. So let's drag and drop him inside of this slot. Then I'll also create a public float variable called speed so that we can control the speed of our enemy. Then inside of the update function is where we will use our special line. So I'll set transform.position to be equal to vector2.move towards. We'll go from our current position, so transform.position, to the target's transform.position. And then I'll pass in my speed variable. Of course, I'll not forget to multiply it with time.delta time to make the movement frame rate independent, like we briefly discussed before. And look at the amazing results that we got with so little codes. The enemy is perfectly following the player rounds with just one line of code. And finally, the ninth piece of code that we use everywhere is the onTriggerEnterToD function. Basically, whatever code we put inside of this function will run automatically when your object collides or touches another object. So you simply need to write void onTriggerEnterToD and inside of a pair of parentheses, you need to take in as an argument a collider 2D called other. So this other argument will basically store the collider 2D component of the object that we collided with. So in Unity, in order for a collision between two objects to be detected, we need a couple of things. First of all, both objects need to have a collider on them. You can think of a collider as an invisible aura around your character to just let Unity know about the boundaries of your character. So let's go ahead and add a box collider 2D component to our player character. You can then go ahead and click on this button here to tweak the size of the collider so that it best fits the shape of the player. We will then go ahead and check the is trigger box here so that we can detect collisions with this object from within our scripts. We will then repeat this exact process and add a box collider 2D component to our enemy. So now that our two objects have colliders, we need at least one of them to have a rigid body 2D component. Rigid bodies are basically components that allow a game object to react to real time physics. So I'll give a rigid body 2D component to my player, for example. We'll just go ahead and set the body type to kinematic so that our object doesn't get affected by gravity. Okay, so to quickly recap, in order to be able to detect a collision in Unity, we need both objects to have a collider on them set to trigger, and at least one object needs to have a rigid body component. We're also going to select your enemy and we're going to give him a tag. So tags are used to, to just basically identify an object. You'll see what I mean by that in just a couple of moments. But for now, just go ahead and create a new tag called enemy. And then once that's done, assign that tag to the enemy character. We'll now open the player control script. So let's go ahead and create our void on trigger enter to the function. Now inside this function, we will check with an if statement if other tag equals equals enemy. So we are basically checking if what we hit has the tag enemy on it. If it does, then we'll go ahead and instantiate some blood particles to let the player know that he got damaged. So I'll come up here and create a public geometric variable called particle effects. Then back down here, I'll instantiate our particle effects at our player's current position, so transform.position, and with no rotation, so quaternion.identity. All right, so back in Unity, I just need to drag and drop my effects into this slot. You'll now see that when the enemy touches the player, some juicy little particle effects get spawned. And that's it guys, we have finished covering our nine most used piece of codes to create games. I mean it that if you master these nine lines of codes, you'll be in a great position to start creating some awesome games. Just take a look at our largest example scene. We have a player that can move around with the arrow keys, an enemy AI that chases the player around and that damages him if he gets touched. And we were able to create all that with some variables, some if else statements, some input.gexis raw, a little on trigger enter 2D, and of course the sneaky vector2.move towards.
So I encourage you to mix and match these awesome pieces of chords and try to come up with some original little games. If you got some value out of this video, please hit the like button down below to let us know that you like this type of content so we can keep producing it for you. Also, comment down below what line of codes you like the most. Anyways, thanks for watching. Cheers.